Welcome back. We have talked about guillotine tools and various styles and construction methods for guillotine tools, but we haven't talked much about the dies, the part of the tool that actually does the work. I'll also talk a little bit about this specific guillotine tool today. This is one that was sent to me by Jerry in Douglas, Wyoming, and he sells these on eBay, and he thought I might like to take a look at it and provide some critique and evaluation of the tool and I'm going to do that. I'll, I'll send him a, an email to tell him what I think of the tool in general. But basically it's a good functional tool, very simple, bolt together design. He sells it typically without a hardy shank so you can add your own or bolt it down to a table if you have an anvil shaped object without a hardy hole. You can bolt this to a workbench or a wood block, a stump, clamp it down to your welding table whatever you need to do with it. So it's got some options that the hardy shank might throw you off and not allow you to use. So that's not a bad idea. So we're going to make some dies for this tool, make some dies for some of the other tools, and we'll see what some of the varieties of dies are. So let's head over to the bench. Here we have a variety of dies that fit various guillotine tools. Most of them are from my Smith & Magician, which uses a three-quarter by two inch die and most of these dies are some form of hardenable material. They have seen a lot of abuse and they're still going strong. Some of the ones that get used more have been dressed and need to be dressed again. You can see a little bit of mushrooming on the top of a few of these. But in general the hardened steel dies last quite a while. So what do we have? The, the die that I recommend if you can only have one die in your Smith & Magician is probably a set of butchers. That's what I use mine for most of the time. And it is extremely handy to have a top and a bottom butcher if you're making tenons, making custom bolts, some riveting projects. I use them on hinges and hooks and things like that. These get used a lot. Sometimes I just need one shoulder though and you can't do that on this. So I actually made up a little plate that goes in the bottom of the Smith & Magician. And that's an advantage to having a full width opening in your guillotine tool. And that just fits in there and then you can butcher only on the top side of your work. That's pretty handy. The next most common die are probably fullers. I guess I ought to take some of these out of the way. And this is a pair of three quarter fullers that fit the Smith & Magician. And here is a set out of the tool Jerry sent me that are half inch dies. I was actually very impressed with how these were shouldering down that piece of pipe. I think the three quarter inch dies are a little bit big sometimes and I don't really like the shoulder. It's a little washed out. The half inch die is much better. You can grind the half inch diameter profile on a three quarter die. You just have to taper it in before you grind your profile. Not a big deal, and we'll probably do that today on one of these sets of dies. Another style of die that I use a, a fair amount and really like are these tenoning dies. And they're kind of a mix and match die, depending on which combination of ends, because you can turn the bottom ones over and switch them back and forth. They don't different top die, different bottom die. And I think there's eight combinations that you can come up with. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different combinations of tenon sizes that you can come up with here. That's pretty useful with only four pieces. If you wanted to do this with individual dies with a round tenon impression, which would be easier to make, you would need eight die sets, which is 16 pieces. So it's a lot more work, but if you like that better, and they do make prettier round tenons if you do the round, and we'll show you how to do that in one of these, and that'll be one of the types of dies we make in round. This style, because of these clean edges and flat bottoms, I'm not even going to try to make. I think you need a milling machine to do that. If you have just the right belt grinder that you can get in here, maybe a one inch wide belt grinder, you can probably come up with something pretty similar. 
but I think that's why these aren't available anymore. I think the current system is one set of dies with holes drilled in the bottom die that take pins and you put different length pins in depending on the length tenon you want. Now here's a set of swedges and they're for necking down bigger pipe and they're rounded this way and curved this way so that they make a, a fairly nice impression. And that's a pretty good way to go for a, a set of dies. And if you were making tenoning dies, this is very similar to what you would make. This would make a nice half inch tenon, except that it doesn't have a crisp shoulder, so it would be, have a washed out shoulder, but you could clean that up with a monkey tool. This is a set of dies meant to make a kind of a ball detail in the middle of a shaft and it's made by drilling sideways then sawing it off and then beveling the shoulders. It does not work as well as I had always hoped it would work but it does work to some extent. This is another very handy set of dies. These are cut off dies because of the square flats here of the shoulders you can't drive the blades together. They'll only go together until they touch. And that means it cuts off very neatly, very cleanly, and you don't mess up the edge. I've only sharpened these things a few times in the oh, 20 years or so I've owned this Smith & Magician. So very good set of dies. This is a 30 degree angle, and I think that's a good angle for this. We might try to make something similar to this, but again, a milling machine would be the way to go. Trying to do this with hacksaw files angle grinder, whatever it is you got, is going to be a lot of work and it's going to be hard to get it accurate. So we may not succeed with this or I may only kind of show you how I would go about it and we may not actually finish it. As we make dies, some handy things is layout fluid, die chem, or, or even a black magic marker works. A little square, a silver pencil, but probably better is a scribe so that you can get lines you can see. Here's one I'm going to turn into a butcher die. I put some die chem on it and I've used my other pre-existing butcher that I know is at, 30, or at 70 degrees and I've scribed across there. Now I'm going to take that to the chop saw, set my chop saw at that angle and cut along that line and that's all there is to making a butcher. So I have my saw set to the angle Make sure that's lined up before I clamp it. It's like a little spacer to make my vise hold better would be in order. It's going to be hot, so you might want to wear gloves or get a pair of tongs. Let's go to the grinder and clean that up. So we're going to take all the burrs off of this and slightly round the back edge so that it isn't a sharp cutting die. These should not leave a cut. It should be just ever so slightly radius on the back side there. Butcher dies just start off like this. You make one cut, then you just flip this around. Make sure you're at a 90 degree angle across here so that they fit properly when they're in use. So that little pair of butchering dies fits this little guillotine tool just perfectly. So they are now a matched set. By the way, these are 4140, and most of the dies I'm going to show you today will be made out of 4140. Now what other kind of die can we make? I've said the other die that is really useful is a fullering die. To make sure that it matches my other die for the same guillotine tool, I'm going to go ahead 
use the other die that I've made, the butcher die that we made previously, and I'm going to use that to make my mark. And this is what I'm going to saw across. Now you can cut this on the chop saw like we did, but because I've already got an ex pretty much an exact same length die, and I don't want to waste any more than I have to, I mean, it's not going to really hurt me to lose the, the width of a chop saw blade, but I'd rather not if I don't need to, and the bandsaw is a little bit smaller, so I'm going to cut this on the bandsaw, and it'll take a little while, but it'll be a cleaner cut in the long run anyway. So we have our two halves and we can make a fuller out of this. Now if you're going to make a three quarter inch fuller, it's just like forging. If you first grind or file this, it's already square, so you file it to octagon and then you knock these corners off and round it, you'll end up with a very nice even round fuller. Unfortunately, I don't want a three-quarter inch fuller. I decided I wanted a half inch fuller. And you can make this any size you want, and you can make it not as sharp a radius and actually end up with a three, uh, one inch or larger curve on this. And I should say diameter, because I'm talking diameters here, not radius. It, it is con a bit confusing. Three-quarter inch diameter would be a three-eighths radius. I'm measuring all the way across and not from the center point, which would be the radius. So hopefully that makes sense. And hopefully I don't confuse you too much because I, I probably swapped the terms off back and forth, even though I'm perfectly clear in my own mind. But if you, if you just cut this not as, as sharp, you can end up with a, a wider diameter on it, a, a larger circle, but it probably won't affect things as nicely as one like this because you won't be able to get it as deep and it'll start leaving square shoulders as you forge that into a piece. So there's a limit to what you can do with these, but making them smaller is no problem. So that we can see my pencil lines easier, let's put a little bit more of the die cam on here. This is pretty handy stuff. Now if I want a half inch in the middle, I need to take a quarter inch off total or an eighth inch off each side. So I've set my square, uses a little gauge. These little four inch combination squares are really quite handy. And I can't just go, I need to be octagon here so I have to relieve this back a little bit before I go to that point. And the exact amount isn't that critical. Just give yourself enough space to work. So I want to take something about like that off all these sides before I grind the octagon into this. And this is a place where the belt grinder is really handy. You can certainly do this with an angle grinder or a file, but you're going to be at it a lot longer trying to do it that way. And yes, you could, you could forge these. The problem with forging is it's going to change shapes and your fit in your guide system is not going to be as precise. You want this to slide very smoothly and if you end up with lumps and bumps from forging, it may not slide smoothly anymore. So for making these dies, I really prefer to machine them. And I don't mean machine like a machinist, I mean machine like a guy with a grinder. And really, a milling machine would be the best way to do this. It would be very precise, you get really nice dies. I just don't happen to own one. But if you do, you probably already know better how to do this than I do.
So there we have a nice little set of fullering dies to go with our butchering dies. What else should we make? One of the simplest dies of all, and that would be just a flat die. A flat die is really nothing more than just a die that has been cut across so that you have a place to forge into a square shoulder. It would be handy for doing tenons and things like that. It's just not gauged to give you a guaranteed size. You have to pay attention to what you're doing. But one set of flat dies will forge any kind of a shoulder situation that you may have, and you don't have to have a big assortment. So they could be very useful. Like I say, you just have to pay attention and keep checking your measurement so you don't go too far. If you can't do that, then you'll have to make some form of specific tenoning dies. Sorry I left you guys out of that one, but I just, just cut that off, gave it just a little bit of a cleanup on the grinder so it's got just a little radius on the shoulder, not very much, and that's all you need for a set of flat dies. Very useful. All of these are very useful. So we've made three different kinds of dies so far. Let's look at a more formal tenoning die that will create a specific size shoulder. Now most of these dies, as we look at them, they're all going to have material in between them when you work them. So that they can be a little bit, they end up being longer in use than what they look like here. But this tenoning die, I'm going to start with just a hair longer piece because it's going to come down tight in the middle. And we'll explain that better as we, we get to that point. And because of that, I want this to be just a hair longer. It's not that important, but my material had just a little bit of extra. This one's about a half inch longer than the other dies, so I figured this would be a good place to use it. If it had come out even on length, I wouldn't have worried about it. Because as long as there's enough material to stick up above the top of the tool so you got something you can strike. Make a nice mark with a scribe here. And I'm going to use my little square again, set for what should be center, or slightly off intentionally, and I end up with two very nice little parallel lines there. I'm then going to center punch right in between those two lines on my first line. But at this point we're missing a little bit of information. And that information is what size tenon do we want this to make? I think I'm going to go for a 3 8 tenon. That sounds like a a good size. So logically I would drill a 3 8 hole there. But it's not going to be that logical for a couple of reasons. The first reason is if you have a round set of dies that come together like this and you put something oversized in here, this is going to pinch the sides of your material and you're going to end up with a bunch of pinch marks that are going to really be ugly and they're going to create weak planes along the length of your tenon. To avoid that, we actually want the tenon die to be more like this. It needs to be more egg-shaped. This size right here is exactly the size we want our tenon to be, but this is much wider out here. It's only about a third of it right through here that needs to be the exact size. So if I drill a larger hole in here, I can get some of this accomplished just by drilling the hole. The other reason that works is that the blade on my chop saw is an eighth of an inch. So when I cut this line on the chop saw, I'm going to remove an eighth inch of material. So if I drill a three-eighths hole, I'm only going to have a quarter inch space here. So I want to drill a half inch hole, and then I want to see if that 
gives me these shoulders. If not, I'll grind those back. Now because I don't want sharp edges on the opening of my little uh, swedge here, on my tinning die, I'm going to go ahead and take those off while it's still round with a countersink. Now it's time to cut that in half. Here is our roughed out tinning die. You can see that the hole in the middle is oblong so that it won't grab the shoulders of the piece you're working on too easily. But depending on how large a piece you're trying to tenon, now if you take it down in the butchers and then you forge it by hand at the anvil or under the flat dies and get it close, this is probably going to work. If you're going to try and take a larger square bar under here, you will probably want to take these shoulders back a little further. But the big issue is, is this the size we want? Now there's lots of ways you could measure that, but they make these really great little measuring devices that are in 64th of an inch sizes, and that doesn't quite fit. That means we're going to have to do just a little bit of filing. My saw blade took out a little more than I thought, or be, when I ground that flat, I may have lost a little bit. There's not a lot of play side to side, so I think I'm going to go to the grinder and I'm going to take just a little bit more off of these corners just to make it a little better and then we're going to file this. Let's go to everybody's favorite screechy activity and we're going to file this to make it just a hair larger. Well there we have it. That's pretty much exactly what I was going for for a tenoning set. That's a specific size. It will only do a 3 8 inch tenon, but it will do it very nicely. And if you want this for different sizes, you just have to do the same thing. 
Now for wider dies, if you've got dies this wide, you might be able to put two different sizes side by side or a starting die that serves as a butcher and has sloped inner sides, which means you can only use it from one side. It's not, don't flip it around accidentally. And then the finishing die on the other side. I've never really liked those. I like the separate butcher better than that, but it is an option. Now that just leaves one type of die, and that would be the cutoff die. Now these are considerably more difficult, and they're going to be considerably more work. I think the cutoff die should be at an angle of 30 degrees, which is a very common angle for cutting tools. And it's also a very easy one to calculate. 30 degrees is exactly one and a half times longer than it is thick. So this is a three-quarter inch thick die. Half of that would be three-eighths of an inch. So three-eighths of an inch plus the three-quarter inch thickness gives us an overall length for the, the bevel of an inch and an eighth. You'll have to figure this out in metric for if you're in a metric country, sorry. So that ultimately is what we want our our bevel to look like. And that's a 30 degree bevel. But we don't want to cut this off and just saw that off because that doesn't make a very good cutting die. You're going to end up really messing things up. You need these stops or you need at least one stop. Now it is possible to cut this and just leave a stop on one side and that means you can cut down with a hacksaw or a bandsaw if you've got a way to hold that properly. But I still like the stops on both sides. It keeps things even and keeps the die from wanting to, to twist quite so much. But doing this by hand, one side is probably the easiest. Again, this is something that really would be easy in a milling machine. You set it up at an angle and you cut back and forth flat and pretty soon you got it just perfect. And if you know a machinist that can cut these for you, that's probably the way to go. You'll get a much better set of dies out of the deal. But we could cut this with a hacksaw, just like this, and only cut down till we have a quarter inch left on the other side for our, our stop block. So we would have to cut all of this material out. That's a fair amount of work, and it's getting late in the day, so I'm not sure if I'm going to do that or not. It would be even more work if we did it this way. And these inch and a half dies, that only leaves us a one inch cut capacity. But for this guillotine tool, we only have one inch between here anyway, so it doesn't matter. For this guillotine tool, we have full width of the dies, so maybe it does matter. So there's, there's some options there. I guess I'm going to start cutting this for a single-sided one because it, I think trying to hacksaw and file this out is just sounds like an awful experience at this point in the day. Uh, you probably could do it. You can file, hacksaw an angle and then get in here with a die grinder, get most of the material out, and then file it clean. If you have a one inch little belt sander and you are willing to take your time because they're pretty slow, you could grind this. My belt sander is two inches so I can't get in there. Now I could strip a belt down to one inch and that would be an option and just split a belt, but I did need a flat platen or a wheel that was only one inch wide and I don't have that either. So that doesn't really do me much good. So I guess I'm going to back up a little bit. I'm going to see what it's like to cut this angle. So I'm going to cut one of these with a hacksaw and see what that's like. And if it's not too bad, maybe we'll do both of them and we'll start to work some of this out. But we're probably not going to get through that today. In fact, I'm probably not going to show all that in a video one way or the other. I think you already understand what needs to be done and you're either willing to tackle it or you're not.
Now regardless of how this works out, I have to do this to at least one side. So I'm going to go ahead and start over here. It's always hard to get going right on a corner. I'm not quite going to go all the way. I'm going to leave something that has to be filed. And that cut went very nicely. So let's go ahead and do the other side. So there are my two cuts. That went pretty easy. But now the hard part is getting rid of all this material. So I'm going to see what an angle grinder will do. I'm going to use a hard disc, but not a cutoff disc. Cutoff disc would be fast to make little slices, but I think it would be hard to clean up. And I think this will give me more control and a smoother cut, even though these are really designed to grind on the flat more so than on the edge. Well that went way quicker than I thought it would and was way more reliable. I was afraid it was just going to really chew this up. But as long as you go slow it's not bad. And that only took about five minutes or so. And it's not quite sharp. I'll get it closer with a file but I'll wait to finish sharpening it after it's been hardened. This is 4140 so I will harden it. And I'm also a little bit narrow in here. I can push these legs back just a hair and I'll do that as I file it. Well here is one half of our set of cutting dies that was way smoother and easier than I thought it was going to be. I don't think I'm anywhere near as concerned as I was. As long as you go slow with the angle grinder and I started with a brand new disc so it had a nice clean edge and wasn't all worn out. This was really very doable. So I think that's something we can we can certainly accomplish in a shop without a milling machine. So I'm uh, more encouraged than I was when I started, I should say. Now Roy Underhill once 
said that he thought he should have named his show, well, you get the idea. And today I'm going to take a page from Roy, because when it comes to the other half of this, well, you get the idea. You can figure that out. I'll do that later off camera. But we have made five sets of dies today. We have made butchering dies, fullering dies, flat dies, a tenoning die, and half of a set of cutoff dies. These all came from a three foot piece of three quarter by one and a half 4140 and there's actually six dies because this set of butchering dies and this guillotine tool actually came out of that same piece of 4140 but these dies will fit either one of these tools. So that's a pretty good day's work and it's not even a day's work this was just an afternoon I started about one o'clock now it's a little after five but that's video time not actual shop time. Your guillotine tool is only as useful as the dies that you put in it. If you make poor quality dies, you're going to get poor quality results. If you only have one set of dies, it's a one trick pony and that's all it's ever going to do. So make good dies, use your imagination and come up with dies that help you do the job you need within reason. Sometimes it's easier to just learn how to do it between hammer and anvil and not rely on a die and a guillotine tool. But if you're doing the same job over and over again and you need repetitive results, sometimes it's worth making dies, especially the general purpose dies like butchers, fullers, and flat dies. Those are very useful dies. Cutoff dies, really handy. These are all things that you will use a lot, but I'm sure you can come up with other ideas for other dies as you use your guillotine tool and do more work with it. Now, we didn't do any dies with this square sh stock guillotine tool and I think at some point we're going to make a V swedge and a V fuller that will help us make V bit tongs with this tool and one of the reasons I like doing that with this tool is because they will be able to turn 90 degrees and still work in the the guillotine tool and we can turn that orientation whichever way we want to but that'll be another video. I still need to put a base on this tool so the die doesn't fall out the bottom when I pick it up because I think that's really annoying. Now at the beginning of the video I showed you the guillotine tool that Jerry from Wyoming sent and he sent that with a set of fullering dies and a set of flat dies that are finished and already have a nice bevel at the top to strike with a hammer and then he also sent a blank die to make something else out of and I'll come up with something to make out of that. My thoughts on this tool, these are initial thoughts, I haven't done much work with it, is it's really a very nice simple little guillotine tool. It's not state-of-the-art, it's not the fanciest one out there, it doesn't have any bells and whistles, it's just a simple functional tool and I think the price that he has on eBay is probably better than a lot of other guillotine tools but if you want to know more about his tool, I recommend you check out his eBay store and I will put a link to it down in the description for this video and you can contact him through that contact on eBay if you're interested and you can make your own decision on whether or not you like this tool. Now the discussion of steel types always comes up and so does hardening and tempering. I did not harden and temper any of these dies today. There just simply isn't time in this video to do that. And it depends on what you make your dies out of. All of these dies, except the cutting die, I think can be made out of mild steel. They will not last as long. They will mushroom over a lot quicker. And if you're using them regularly, you're going to wish you'd made them out of hardened steel. But you don't have to. If mild steel is all you've got, you can make mild steel dies. But I like hardened dies. They last longer. The dies in my original Smith & Magician I have been using for something like 20 years. And yes, I've had to dress the tops of a few of the dies. Not all of them. Some of them are still in original condition because they get used very rarely. But the ones that I use all the time, like the butcher and the cutoff tool, they get dressed from time to time, maybe once a year. And they have never been a problem. The mild steel dies that I made for it, the, the fuller that I don't use that often, 
has been dressed a lot and it's swollen up to the point that it likes to stick in the tool and I've shown you that on some previous videos so my preference is to make dies that you can harden no matter what the die is you don't have to if you've got mild steel and that's all you can afford go ahead and use it an option for mild steel would be to quench it in super quench and you can find recipes for that online we'll cover that someday I don't have the exact formula in my brain and I've never actually used it because I'm not much into making mild steel tools but if you're making mild steel tools super quench can be a wonderful thing because it does make mild steel harder than it normally is so it's a good thing don't use super quench for any steel that hardens by any other means you're just gonna break it the way you harden and temper your dies is dependent on the steel these are 4140, they are an oil hardening steel. S7 would make excellent dies, that's an air hardening steel. O1 would make good dies, that's an oil hardening steel. W1 wouldn't be bad dies, but it's pretty darn expensive when you get up into sizes like this and a little harder to find in this kind of a size. So that's not one I would use, but 4140, S7, and O1 are pretty good steel for making dies for your Smith & Magician. If you can find 5160 in this size, that would probably also make excellent dyes and it's also oil hardening but read the books and uh, heat treaters guide app on your phone if you have it to get the specifics for how you should harden those materials if those are what you want to use and if you're using mild steel super quench or don't harden it and just plan on repairing your dyes more often no big deal either way I suspect this video may have gone into extra innings it feels like it's been a long afternoon in the shop I think it's supper time and I think I'm going to call it a day and I'm going to head in. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up and of course I'd love it if you'd hit that subscribe button. That way you know when new videos come out and you can stay up on what we're doing and follow the projects from start to finish. If you like the videos and you would like to help support the channel financially to help guarantee that the videos continue, there is a link down below for PayPal and another link for Patreon and you may donate through those sites if you so choose but there's never going to be paid content the content is free you can watch it here on YouTube all you want without a donation those are simply donations I do appreciate everybody watching I'm glad you stopped by but now take time to get out to your shop make something if you've already made a guillotine tool maybe you can make some dies if you haven't made a guillotine tool, make it first and then make the dies. But either way, get out to your shop, enjoy your time in the shop, do stay safe, and do wear your safety glasses, and we'll see you for the next one.